I am going to introduce our panel moderator, and then I will work with uh, Todd Palmer and feeding him questions from the audience once the panelists are through. So it gives me great pleasure to introduce Todd Palmer, who is the executive director of the Chicago Architecture Biennial. Todd comes to the Chicago Architectural Biennial from the National Public Housing Museum, where he has served as curator since 2013. He has held concurrent posts of interim director and associate director. His efforts to raise the profile of the museum's idealistic mission culminated in the National Public Housing Museum's 2015 Chicago Architectural Biennial Program Partnership Exhibition. Todd is deeply engaged as both a thoughtful leader and a creative practitioner. He has served on the National Endowment for the Humanities Group in 2015. Currently, Todd Palmer is a board member of the Chicago Cultural Alliance Leadership Council. He has spoken widely here in the United States and abroad about his work in museum leadership, design, and the arts. He's published widely, and his publications include works commissioned by the Avery Review for its Chicago Architectural Biennial Edition and the Studio Museum in Harlem's Harlem World exhibit of several years ago. Todd Palmer is both a tiger and a lion. He holds a Bachelor of Arts, summa cum laude, in architectural history and theory from Princeton University, tiger, huh? And a Master of Architecture from Columbia University, the Lions. Todd Palmer, let's give him a big round of applause. Yeah, I got it. Thank you, Ed, for that warm introduction. And I was puzzled over tigers and lions. And I'm embarrassed, to, I mean, tigers I got because undergrad you have to, but lions, grad school, I had, actually didn't know Columbia were lions, so. Um, shows I'm not, a, a great sport. I mean, the one gap in my resume is sports, so you'll just have to forgive me for that. Um, thank you to the, everyone at the City Club for having the biennial here today. Um, and I'm looking for my notes. We, it's really a great a stage, and I've been um, lucky for a few times to be invited as a guest here um, as a civic platform for Chicago on, on, on important urban issues. And we'd like to, to introduce today to, to a sort of upstart organization, the Biennial. It's our second year. Um, and we'd like to think that um, some you know, decades from now we'll still be around um, to, to continue the conversation and collaborate with, with organization, organizations like this one. Um, I want to just recognize a, a few of these names were called out, but uh, many of the, of the, the august members of this occasion are actually involved in the binding in, in many different ways. So Jack Guthman, of course, is the chairman of the board of the Chicago Architecture Biennial. <laughs> also from our board, we have Michelle Boone, Lynn Lockwood, and Valerie Cor Hansard here today. And some of our most important partners are here um, from uh, the Department of Planning and Development, who has a wonderful biennial exhibit across the street from the exhibit that we'll be mostly looking at today, um, Commissioner David Reithman. <laughs> from the Department of Cultural Affairs and Special Events, which is our, our key partner. We couldn't have a biennial in the Cultural Center without them, who are also our landlord, um, and Hickey, the Deputy Commissioner. And from the Chicago Architecture Foundation, Lynn Osmond. And of course, this year we inaugurated an amazing alignment with Expo Chicago and want to recognize Tony Carmen. All right, so what is the impact of hosting a global event of the biennial? Um, it's something that we think can't be underestimated, and, my, and the speakers tonight. Um, who I'll be in dialogue with will get at, at some of the possibilities. I know all of you are actively involved 
in civic affairs and, and also love this city. Um, and at the same time, we know as great as Chicago is, it faces um, a number of challenges, uh, including uh, uh, assets that haven't been fully leveraged and potentials that haven't been fully realized. And so the, the, the biennial actually grows out of the cultural plan from Mayor Ma Rahm Emanuel um, in two, 2012, and actually Michelle Boone here was really instrumental in looking at architecture as an asset that obviously is, is familiar and, and even infamous around the world, but perhaps hadn't been um, taken advantage of to its full potential. And at the same time, this architecture of the city is also the lens through which we understand some of the inequalities and challenges, the, the imbalances in density and, and beauty and, and investment. So what better place to bring the city together and also put us on a global stage than to, to think about architecture. So we'll talk a little bit about how we got from that conversation to a biennial. Um, and I, I should also just recognize that in order to create this biennial, we have some, some significant funders and um, from, from both BP, Valerie's here today, but also S.C. Johnson, our lead funders, um, that, that made this all possible. Uh, so with us today, I'll bring up the panel because I could go on at length about why the biennial is important, but we'd like to hear from our internationally acclaimed artistic directors of the second edition, Sharon Johnston and Mark Lee, they're an award-winning architecture firm based in Los Angeles. They just recently opened a renovation of the MCA here in Chicago and uh, the Menil Institute in Houston. Uh, Martin Felsen and Sarah Dunn will join us. They are participants in the, this 2017 biennial from Urban Lab. They are a husband and wife team. They've been named Global Visionaries by WBEZ, and you'll see their work often at Chicago Architecture Foundation as curators. They've been really concerned with large-scale urban projects dealing with sustainability, specifically concerned with water. Um, and uh, actually, some of these images that you're seeing when they're not of the biennial, we're not going to address them specifically, but I just want to call out, when you see real buildings, <laughs> those are the, both the collective work of Sharon Johnston, Mark Lee, Sarah Dunn, and Martin Felsen. So I'd like to call you up to the stage, and we'll begin the conversation. This is going to be a grilling, so get ready. Right. All right. So the first question I want to ask you, Sharon and Mark, um, to to help us think about what is a biennial, but maybe in defining what a biennial is, to to put it in a global context. Um, you travel around the world, Lisbon and Venice. Um, w what's a biennial looking in that context? Well, I think a biennial. Is this, can you guys hear us? Yeah. I think a biennial is a chance to bring, of course, some of the most um, exciting and innovative practices from around the world to a place um, to, to start a dialogue about uh, relevant issues for cities um, around the world, particular urban issues, all of the things that I think um, speak to the impact that architecture can make on cities. And I think for for Mark and I, when we were you know, invited to be um, part of this year's biennial, first of all, we were already, um, I think, really invested in the city of Chicago. We've been working with the MCA um, for several years, and we had been part of the first biennial. And I think for us, it was not only uh, an opportunity to have an international dialogue about architecture in Chicago, but also to really look at Chicago as a kind of, as an urban laboratory. I think the legacy of Chicago its architectural history resonates around the world. I mean, when you, any time we would be asking participants from faraway places, I mean, Chicago is a kind of, kind of um, kernel of their own education as architects. So it was always um, yes. We we almost never, no one ever turned us down. Um, and so I think that's an incredible opportunity for this biennial in particular. And Mark, do you want to talk about? Like the, the other biennials around the world, how does this compare or contrast or By fit way, in? I just realized we are Sharon and Mark and, and Sarah and Martin. It's kind of a nice symmetry. Oh, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, thank you for that kind of thoughtfulness. <laughs> uh, but uh, you know, I think as participants of the first biennial, um, uh, we, were, we were shocked 
by how well it was received and how many people around the world were participated or, or came to see the biennial. Uh, perhaps the grandfather of all architectural biennials would be the Venice Biennial. And I, I think one of the statistics that really shocked me was that the, uh, the very first Chicago Biennial in comparison to the Venice Biennial was open only half the amount of time of the Venice one, mm -hmm. but generated twice as many visitors. So I thought that was an incredible fact. Huh? That, that it always seems inevitable that Chicago should have an architectural biennial. It's, it's ingrained in its history. You know, and and I, certainly this is a very uh, young biennial compared to a lot of other biennials. But I think the important thing is that it's not just the biennial itself, but also it's tapped into a city that has an incredibly rich architecture history. I would say Venice and Chicago are the only two cities that really have, have that type of aspect. So you mentioned the word history, and, and the theme this year, of course, is make new history. Mm -hmm. okay, Tell us about w why you picked that theme at this particular time in 2017. What, what makes history something to concern us in terms of innovation or the future? Well, you know, I think um, when we selected the theme, Make New History, uh, this is something that we responded to the very first biennial that was uh, Sarah Herder and Joseph Greemer, uh, art directed. Uh, we, we believe the biennials are never singular events. You know, the biennials, it's important to understand uh, four or five biennials together, and we look back in time and we understand the, what happened within a decade. And, and, and the notion of history is something that we noticed that was quite prevalent in the very first biennial. Uh, we, we believe that this is a time when uh, there's an abundance amount of information and an abundance amount of images that's flowing around. Everything seems to be flatlined and horizontal. And I think, you know, the understanding of history, understanding of how things come about and how things evolved is uh, something that is very uh, attractive to uh, a lot of young people and young architects where uh, you can grab an image over on, on, on the web or online and there's, there's nothing that, that, everything seems equal. What happens yesterday seems similar to what happens 500 years ago. And I think understanding this historical structure mm -hmm. gives it meaning. Mm -hmm. yeah. I think just related to that and perhaps another notable aspect of the Chicago Biennial, at least from the first two uh, exhibitions, is that it generally has engaged uh, a younger generation of architects. And I think that that was one way, starting with Sarah and Joseph, that we could also differentiate our program from the sort of grandfathers of Venice and other such programs. And I think related to what Mark was just pointing out about the importance of history that we observed in many of the practices in the first biennial was is that history also helps us understand our context in a different way and I think of a num number of younger generations of practicing architects are are really interested in the fabric of cities perhaps the kind of era of the star architect and the icon is, is, is still there and is still a kind of necessary part of the fabric of cities but really understanding how we can build up the fabric of historic places um, with contemporary ideas is important. And I think a lot of what you see in the biennial this year is about that, is really understanding from the scale of a detail or a historic hutong in China to um, the way that sort of small villas in Greece are, are, are scavenged to be collect materials and put them together. I think there's a real sensitivity to the history of, of, of architecture and material as a way to project a kind of new future for cities that's sustainable and, 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 and innovative, but in a way that's grounded perhaps in um, past practice. I'm going to just reflect as a response, just we, when you talk about young architects, um, it's an interesting profession. I was trained, as mentioned, um, in history of architecture and also the practice, uh, the professional practice, but a young architect um, is not a young rock star. You don't you don't rock out at 25. <laughs> you rock out at like four, in your 40s. So, <laughs> but I think it's interesting because it, there is a maturity that comes with youth and architecture, just the complexity. Um, so we're going to call in our young architects at the other end, um, who are uh, from sh from Chicago. And I, uh, one of the interesting things I want to just throw out is that that Sharon and Mark were participants in the first biennial, and so Sarah and Martin are participants in this. So I'd like to ask you to talk about what we see at the biennial from the perspective of your participating, so what would we see if we looked for what you actually made, but having observed it and visited, what, what other things strike you about the biennial that you'd like to share with us? Yeah, I think uh, we, um, we have actually seen the biennial now two times as participants we were in 
invited to be in the first one as well. And uh, both in both biennials, and especially in this one, it's super interesting, the prompt of looking at the past to make a new future. And what we started with was uh, a really um, specific prompt from um, Sharon and Mark to uh, look very specifically at a project from the past. And so we lo looked at something that really uh, was interesting to us, a set of uh, architects from the 60s um, when they were dealing with crises of their own time, which sound very familiar to our time, global uh, climate change, it was called something different then, but uh, the crisis of the environment, the crisis of population, the crisis mm -hmm. of modernity. So we looked back to, the, to this group um, in order to make a proposal looking forward um, that um, we thought spoke to both kind of the context of Chicago and also to maybe the American context of, of where architecture is in the, in the United States right now. Uh, so we found that that kind of both the constraint of the biennial and the freedom of the biennial is really interesting. We don't, we don't make uh, the, 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 there's a picture of what we proposed uh, and built for the biennial. We don't do that every day. So the interesting thing about the biennial is it gives you a, as architects and urban designers a freedom to think big uh, and test kind of crazy ideas that may have some impact maybe now or in the future in order to allow people to envision alternate futures? Uh, sure. Um, yeah, I can build on that. Um, although thinking big, we're working on a project for a new city in China right now for half a million people. And that's why it was a little late. We, <laughs> we went into crisis last night at around 1 in the morning when we got new information that for some reason we didn't have before uh, that had to get translated. But anyway, I, what strikes me in this biennial and maybe the last one too is the the difference between uh, reactive work that architects do and proactive work. So reactive work is we're all architects. We have offices. People call us hopefully and ask us to do things. And that's it's reactive in the sense that we're working with a client on projects uh, that that um, uh, that that we just do and and we become part of this collaborative team. Uh, in, in, in very uh, eager ways all the time. But then there's a whole group of architects doing proactive work. They're searching for projects that really have to be done because of some kind of vulnerability in our communities or some kind of lack of uh, services that are being provided, some kind of infrastructure that's not uh, available. And these become unsolicited projects that architects just uh, stimulate and then build teams and then pursue with lots of different people and lots of different ways of doing that. And those come out in, the, in, in biennials uh, and biennales around the world that um, in ways that the kind of local project becomes very global and it gives everybody a chance to talk about what architects can do without being asked to do it in the first place. And there's a lot of architects, landscape architects and other uh, collaborators that we always work with, very creative people, that do push projects ahead, uh, try to pr produce momentum that becomes public and hopefully partnerships build with localities and municipalities and other kind of uh, nonprofits like the Chicago Architecture Foundation here. And so for me, that's, that's kind of the most exciting thing that, that I see mm -hmm. as both a participant but also just an admirer of uh, biennials. So I'm going to keep on what one will see, but I'm going to just, it, it's one thing that's remarkable is that actually Sarah and Martin's project, you might think was a very serious, pro I mean, it's a very serious project, but yet in the biennial, it's probably one of the more popular uh, attractions. I, I mean, it's almost functions, it, so it's a kind of mirrored box, and you'll see it come up on the screen with um, cactuses and mountains and people, and it's referring to this image from this kind of hippie modernism in Italy where they were looking at the United States. So I'd like Sharon and Mark to weigh in on just how do you, how, you know, obviously architects dealing with some, architecture's dealing with some serious issues, and yet it's, the biennial is being received in a very popular way. We see the towers here. Mm -hmm. Could you describe maybe a few projects that straddle or, or perhaps it's fun and seriousness and interesting ways that move a conversation ahead in the field, but also appeal to a general public and 
Um, yeah. Yeah. Well, I think um, the towers that you've seen, you know, this is, uh, for those who haven't been to the biennial, this is, uh, uh, we invited 15 architects to uh, reimagine the, the skyscraper. Uh, not only because Chicago is the birthplace of the skyscrapers, but also there was a very famous uh, competition, well, for the Chicago Tribune building in 1922. Um, all of you here know the building as the physicality of the building very well, but maybe some of you might not know that there were, it was one of the most important international competitions uh, in 1922, uh, where hundreds of architects from all around the world proposed buildings, uh, pro uh, designed proposals for the for the building. And uh, all those that are not exec uh, executed has been studied. You know, there are a lot of groundbreaking design that happened uh, that was submitted for that competition. And I would say over the last uh, 80, 90 years, this competition has been studied all around the world. Like someone in Angola would know the, the, the competition that came second place, which was copied and built in Houston. You know, so, so it's a it's 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 a part of the history of Chicago that is uh, has an international resonance, you know. So, on, on one hand, there's this kind of in, important history of the skyscraper that is quite serious. We think. Uh, on the other hand, you know, we love how many different people reinterpreted the, the, or rethink the skyscraper in very different ways. For example, uh, Tatiana Bilbao, a, a, an architect from Mexico City, uh, she really envisioned the future skyscraper as a, a vertical. Uh, city, a uh, vertical neighborhood, where different architects would, would participate and build very different types of things that could be plugged into a, 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 a superstructure that she, she designed. So it is something that is both visionary, but also quite funny and accessible. You know? So you see 15 different architects uh, designing small buildings that are attached like barnacles to a, to a, to a tree. You know, and you see how they envision the interior life and how they envision the different materiality. You know, I think, that's, I think this is something that is important for us as uh, artistic directors, that we wanted to, on one hand, reach to a very large audience, that someone who are not as crazy about architecture could get something out of it. But those who are that really into it could get something deeper. Mm. Mm -hmm. And if we, the Tatiana Babao Tower, uh, I didn't notice until recently, there's like little monkeys hanging and, and construction tape. So there's some sort of play and jokes. And it kind of leads me to my next question about just that you're all educators, you all are teaching actually at the college or graduate school level. Um, uh, and, and thinking about the biennials role um, as, a, as a teaching tool or an opportunity for learning at, at all ages, whether it's graduate students or perhaps even professionals. Um, how, how any of you that wants to speak to this idea of the biennial as, as something that we can learn from? Well, I think one thing about this biennial, um, I think it was, we, Mark spoke a little bit about the diversity of audiences that we're trying to reach. I think that uh, we've been so excited about the way in which um, the Chicago Architecture Foundation has sort of taken the lead in creating a really um, diverse and sort of multi-tiered uh, educational program for, you know, different different ages and maybe levels of knowledge about architecture to engage with the program. But I think for us, kind of going back to the bigger question of why do a biennial, I mean, much of much work today, it's everything's accessible almost on the internet, Instagram, all these things. And I think for, for Mark and I, we really feel like part of the mission of a program like this is to create spatial environments, to, to let people that aren't maybe that familiar with architecture experience what architects do. So one of the things that we took quite seriously in our curatorial mission was to create spatial environments in the biennial. Um, many people see the challenges of exhibiting architecture where often the end result is a building, which is obviously something that you, you can't exhibit in the traditional way. And so many of the environments were transforming the rooms of the cultural center, which is a pretty magnificent historical building, but challenging nonetheless to exhibit architecture in, given the kind of historic patina and scales of, of the rooms. So like the vertical city was one where we were really trying to take on the scale of that room. And so, you know, young children could walk through the hypostyle hall of towers and really feel like they were part of something bigger. And, you know, I think that that was kind of a mandate. There are other moments where the kind of long corridors that they're transformed into galleries. So thinking about different points of entry is important, that there isn't sort of you know, top-down knowledge that we're expecting people to take away from it, but but sort of trigger different um, points of engagement. Yeah, and one of the, uh, I think one of the events where we presented the biennial, the mayor of Chicago was there, and he said something like, uh, if you see it 
you believe it. You can be it. You can, you be, can, it. You it. can, you can be it. You can see it. You can be it. You can be it. And I think for us, it's that's one of the reasons for creating something that is like life life scale, like larger than life. Mm -hmm. So visiting the biennial, you have a very visible visceral experience that's different from looking at representations of building on a screen or a book. But you go there, you really physically feel the scale of buildings that looms larger than you, and you realize that you shape cities, and the cities shape our lives. And I think that that part is important for us. Anecdotally, we, we watch and we work closely with the team at CAF. Um, we also have our own uh, kind of quite large a volunteer team, about 141 that work quite closely with the DKs and Choose Chicago volunteers. But we hear anecdotes from the floor, and one of, one of them uh, is like a, a young uh, a kid from the Mexican-American community seeing Frida Escobedo, a, a Mexican American, or not Mexican American, a Mexico City based architect, a woman who's taken over the entryway and then seeing uh, Tatiana Bobao and this amazing tower and saying, oh, I didn't know there were Mexican architects and certainly not women. Um, so I think this idea of both projecting like something that you can do, but also that you can be. There's also one of the towers is by Francis Carre, who's an African architect working in Berlin. Um, so it's uh, so I think all these things are super important. Bringing it back to the profession, I'm going to ask a question of Martin and Sarah. So one of the kind of minor controversies you could say or rumbles about the biennial, I think, was was the sense that or confusion that perhaps a Chicago architecture biennial should be all about Chicago architects, and it's and it's not. It's, there's 141 architects this year and artists participating from 25 countries around the world. And as practicing Chicago architects, I wonder if you could talk about um, what are the benefits or what, what or maybe not benefits is not the right word, but what are, the, what are some of the positive outcomes of inviting the world to Chicago um, for a Chicago architect? Um, speaking of Chicago architects. <laughs> um, well, I think it's just, it's the right thing to do to kind of bring people here and have conversations about architecture and not have the conversation with, with ourselves, but to kind of expand the conversation. We in Chicago see ourselves as a global city, and so we need to think globally. And uh, I guess I never even considered that a Chicago architecture biennial would only be Chicago architects uh, when the kind of general understanding of, of biennials is to create local, national, and international audiences for a, con uh, a theme or a conversation. So I guess it's wonderful to have, especially in the opening in the early weeks when people are coming from all over the country and all over the world to Chicago, see what's happening in Chicago, and also we see what's happening everywhere else. Uh, for you know, just a kind of super selfish uh, thing of, of being able to have uh, other people come to us is really wonderful, I think. Yeah. yeah, I think that the biennial reflects the city, no matter which biennial it is. Uh, and as Mark and Sharon were talking about, there were, there's quite a bit of um, embedded history within the program and, and the initial concept of the way that this biennial uh, uh, was originally conceived. And even the last one was conceived um, via a, con a, a, a concept that was, I think, originated in the 70s in Chicago, the state of the art, was that in the 70s mm -hmm. something? Mm -hmm. So I think there's an absolute reflection that goes back and forth between what's, what, what the basic premise of the biennial is and then how it's organized and everybody who works in the, everyone who is invited to participate in, in um, the biennial for sure dug into the history of Chicago thought about the contemporary scene in Chicago, and then somehow tried to, um, uh, tried to uh, reflect on that and present that back to the city. And we can see it if we go to a uh, biennial in China, in a city in China, all of a sudden it really shifts to a new kind of construct. Uh, when it is in Venice, it shifts to a different construct. So even though it might not, there might not be a lot of architects from Chicago in the Chicago biennial, all of the architects in the Chicago Biennial are thinking about Chicago while they're uh, thinking about their projects. The other way to think about it is from some of the ancillary programming that was done. So the Chicago Architecture Foundation had a partner program with 50 Chicago architects 
thinking about uh, the city. And that project is about uh, each um, looking at all the wards in Chicago, all 50 wards, that's why there are 50 architects, and contemplating the, um, the missing projects or the, or the missing opportunities, looking, digging into the assets that those communities have and thinking about how those assets that pre-exist can be rejuvenated to bring a whole new type of uh, infrastructure or benefit or um, any, a value to those, to those communities. And so I think that there's a give and take in the different layers, I suppose, mm -hmm. of, the, of the biennial that is really rich and multifaceted. No, I think I think next time we should do a satellite show at the city in China that you're designing. <laughs> so we already have half a million visitors. Sure. <laughs> right. The, the mayor's, mayor's on that idea. Um, one of my favorite words is reciprocity, and I think you got to that. That to me, there's there is this important. You know, there's, we benefit as Chicagoans from bringing the world here, but then coming here, there's something that we have to teach. And I think like the CAF shows a perfect example. There's some images, not this one actually, but that you'll see cycling of anchor sites around the city, six embedded cultural institutions serving communities, and they hosted their own um, exhibitions. When I was at public housing, we did. And the idea that, that these local stories, public housing stories, or Mexican American stories, or Puerto Rican stories really can be shared with the world and that having new audiences. I remember being at public housing with young women that you know, grew up in public housing and having them talk to a visiting a journalist or the dean of the School of Architecture at Columbia University was really empowering. And in fact, they were the experts and you know, Amal, who's the dean, that has to listen. And it was real beautiful moments that occur, I think, when we open the city up and, and show people that you know, what happens on their block is, can be really meaningful half a world away. Mm -hmm. um, talking about half a world away, I'm just going to keep this on global practice in China. Um, you, you're Chicago architects, and, and then we have Los Angeles architects practicing um, in the world, and maybe just reflecting on what, what an architect brings to working afar, um, and, and not necessarily biennial related, but just your architects, and let's talk about professional practice. Sure, I can just start and dig in a little bit. So one of the things that uh, Sarah and I always contend being Chicago architects is that Chicago has uh, some of the most unique features in the world in terms of its urbanism. And, and it, uh, for us, it has a lot to do with the lake and the position of, of Chicago on this resource that's really a global resource, but locally stored uh, by us in good ways, hopefully. Um, and so, uh, we've done a number of projects with the city uh, that have to do with water in Chicago, and because of that, because of that work, um, we are starting to get some projects globally that are dealing with the same set of conditions. Um, not only how does a city um, deal with it, its environment and its infrastructure and its buildings in relationship to natural resources, in this case water, but also from a Chicago standpoint, how does a city drive its identity through some kind of natural resource that's as monumental and as important as the, as the lake. Um, so Sarah and I are not from Chicago, so when, when we got here, we realized that the lake is really this incredible icon, um, both in terms of its physical identity, but also from its more ephemeral uh, makeup of people in, in Chicago, feeling a kind of connection to the natural world and how that natural world merges with the physical world, the artificial world that we all design. And I think that's lost on all of us on an everyday basis. But uh, the idea that, um, that we're building and creating our city around uh, resources that are scarce, that people are fighting over, that are under conflict in so many other parts of the planet, and that we are developing our city in order to embrace and to protect and to try to enable this resource to last forever, but also to provide ourselves an identity that is very unique globally, is something that we are frankly exporting uh, to other cities that we're working on. And so the city that we're designing right now is on uh, one of the largest lakes, freshwater lakes in China. And the reason that they asked us to work on it was because of our, directly because of our experiences here in Chicago as, our, as designers. That's really interesting. I'm going to reframe this question for you guys. You're, you're not so much what do you bring from LA to the world, but you're, you know, the biennials 
coming to a close, come see it before January 7th. <laughs> Jan will kill me if I don't tell you. It's open, free to the public. Um, but you're moving, you know, you've done this exhibition, you've brought 140 participants together from around the world, obviously seeing things in this work or seeing the response. Um, how, does, how does being part of a biennial last time or arti artistic directing at this time, how does that inform then going out and building in the real world or the kinds of things that you're looking at, um, what, like your future as practitioners? Mm -hmm. Well, I mean, a couple responses. I think um, it, perhaps another thing that in a way is maybe doesn't define, but is a, I think a really important dimension of our sort of rough generation of architects is that more and more we find ourselves collaborating with each other. Oftentimes we find more and more we're working on group projects. Mark and I and our, our firm are working on a project in Chile that was initiated by um, one architectural practice, Peza van Erlikhausen, who's also in the biennial, and they were able to harness federal government money to commission 10 architects from around the world as part of the, the earthquake reconstruction project. So the idea of bringing, building community through exhibitions like this I think is really important and I think whether it's through teaching practice or building practice, I think there's a level of support and collaboration globally amongst our peers that is quite different than previous generations. And so the, the ability to come together, I think you were remarking Sarah on the sort of power of having you know, 150, 200 people here together, many of which are colleagues from all around the world, is can be underestimated the importance of the energy and the possibilities that come out of that time together. And I also think, I mean, for Mark and I, um, you know, one of our areas of expertise, if you could say, is working in the cultural realm. And I think that more and more we're finding, I mean, with the project we just finished with the MCA, which was so, they were so, re they were so ready for us. And I think in the sense that, the MCA has recognized the value and the importance of the cultural realm, cultural education as being a way to um, bring people together. There's less and less public space in the world, and so how can institutions be hosts for a sort of safe, diverse um, environment to deal with difference, to deal with different points of view? And so in our museum work, here in Chicago, in Houston, our work in overseas, I think that there's a real sense that the cultural realm is becoming a sort of an agency for kind of political discourse that's safe, diverse, and open. I think that's something that biennials, the biennial has done as well in terms of kind of expanding the way in which we can think about architecture to shape cities and engage really challenging social problems in cities around the world. Okay, I think we're ready for some questions from you on the floor. Okay, if you have a question, just hold up your card and uh, members of our staff will come by and pick them up. Oh, no questions. We have one question here, okay. Todd. This is from Mary Jane Keitel with the Field Museum. How does one get involved in planning future biennial events? And the second part of that is, when does your planning begin for the future? Hmm. Good question. I guess these are for me. That's a loaded question. <laughs> um, <laughs> so the planning, well the second question is easier to answer than the first. Uh, we are planning. Um, we have, as I mentioned, a wonderful board. Um, Sharon and Mark have lent some thought about uh, what, what the next artistic directorial leadership will look like. Um, and we're, and I, I, we've tried our best to be open in terms of uh, the partnerships with programming like the ones that uh, CAF did and the anchor sites. So all of that is in development and my door is open actually to send me a note. Um, we like to include a lot of voices. One of the things that I like to talk about is that, that, that for us, I guess, answer the question that I pose to you is that learning from the biennial is, is not the idea that we just replicate the same you know, there's some fundamentals, like there's a major exhibition that brings in the world. There's the fundamental that we engage all parts of the city, that we engage professionals, we engage arts and culture uh, um, beyond the field of architecture. We engage young people, uh, the general public, but the shape of that and, and who and how, um, for example, the, if the Field Museum hasn't been a part this time, um, certainly uh, let's talk and, and figure out what we can do together. Thank you. 
Uh, this question is from Eva Silverman, who's with the Terra Foundation for American Art. Eva, where are you? Back there. Great. Um, how do you measure the impact of CAB? And what are the factors you look for in gauging your success? What do you think, guys? <laughs> All the questions are for me. Um, so, yeah, I think, well, an obvious metric, and probably the first one is, a, is, a, is attendance, but I think it's, I mean, which is super important, and I don't want to dismiss it. We have had strong attendance so far. Um, last time I looked, we were, you know, 17,000 or so um, visitors uh, a week just to the cultural center sites. We'll also be measuring attendance at our anchor sites and our special project sites, which include Navy Pier, um, the Water Tower Gallery, um, which is a DK site, and uh, uh, the Garfield Park Conserv Conservatory, um, where actually we have international architects that were um, invited by Sharon and Mark ex on exhibit, also there till January 7th. So help us count. Come back more than one time. We have no way of telling. <laughs> But um, so there every expectation, and I, um, you know, we're, we're on the hook. Last time, 500,000 visited, we expect to, to at least meet that. But I don't think that that's, as I alluded to before, the most important measurement. Um, certainly, it demonstrates a sort of economic potential. It demonstrates a kind of level of um, engagement and excitement. But we'd like to measure more uh, qualitatively that we're changing conversations, that we're opening up. Um, new communities and new um, ways of thinking about architecture, that we have this education program where we, we've worked actually with several funders, including the Polk Family Foundation, to, or Polk Brothers Foundation, rather, um, to do um, sort of more uh, qualitative evaluation to understand what people are learning, and then helping us learn and help, and actually to that point of planning. We can't plan without a feedback loop, and the first biennial, I think there was, you know, phenomenally executed and so challenging to get off the ground, but there wasn't much infrastructure then to, to properly learn from the first one. So, but invariably we did, and, and I mean, I think Sharon and Mark being part of it was instrumental, and in certain ways my seeing it from afar as a partner helped me think about what does it look like to be outside of the biennial yet a part of it, and how can we be more transparent about how we engage. So we'll keep learning and we invite, you know, again, feedback, because feedback is part of that feedback loop. You know, Todd, I was thinking yeah, about what, the... Uh, what our panelists, Mark and that, oh. Sharon, uh, Martin and Sarah, look for from your perspectives. I was just uh, thinking about uh, this qualitative measure. You know, I, I'm thinking of that urban myth about uh, uh, Velvet Underground's uh, first record only sold 500, but then 500 of people who bought the record form bands. Okay. You know? that's so great. I was thinking, yeah. what would be the equivalent? You know, I, I, no, I was thinking about no, the, what, what, what's the equivalent? Like, if 500 kids come to to look to cab. Uh, is the success rate measured by 500 kids who want to become architects or 500 kids who are scared away from the architectural profession? You know? I think both are, are success metrics. You know? So you'd settle for 250. Yes, in the middle. Uh, sure, maybe, maybe another way to uh, uh, kind of approach that, that question is it, with the idea of pride in a city. And it's not easy for people, I think, these days to have a lot of pride in their city. Everyone's kind of searching for for how to place that emotion. Uh, and there's so many identities that we each carry. But I think pride in a city has everything from an architectural point of view to do with it, the city's visibility. Mm -hmm. So archi what architects do is we, we plug in this last final, almost like battery into a city that is this visible connection to the rest of it. So our buildings connect to every other possible system. They could, uh, from energy and food to transportation, uh, and, and all kinds of educational health issues that go along with the city. And all of that's invisible. What becomes the kind of iconic quality of a city are these moments of, of the architect and everybody who works with us, for sure, uh, working together. And if we do it right uh, as a city, all of those visible parts become something that everybody collectively can take a lot of pride in. And the biennial, what it does is it introduces us to the idea that this is really one of the only cities not only producing the biennial for the rest of the world to see because we want to show off 
uh, how much pride we really do have in what we've accomplished so far. But I think it also has to do with the ambition of the city. You know, this is something that takes an enormous effort every couple of years, and everybody hopefully gets behind. And it's something that everyone, I think, it, at least from uh, uh, the perspective of kind of younger generations, to really push the city into a kind of global world in a way that's very visible. And we almost don't have a choice but to kind of produce our best work and our best kind of ideas out and push it out into the world. And I think that does make a big difference uh, to what we do. And if we do it every two years and know that we're gonna have to show something every two years, I think it will change the quality, the physical quality of, the, of our surroundings. Okay, thank you, we have time. Uh, we have one last question here <clears throat> and then a comment. Uh, this is from Charles Smith with Canon Design. Charlie, where are you? Oh, over there, good. How can we rally public funding to support ideas to advance things like the biennial? <laughs> this is what happens when you're the executive director, <laughs> Mr. Palmer. My favorite top, actually, public housing museum in my, my mantra was that it's as much about the public as it is about housing. Um, so we were asking a lot about public investment. I'm, well, DCase is, is, is a public entity, and I, and I think for our point of view, actually, we're proud that we don't get public money right now because we know there's so many, you know, vital, I mean, it's, that's a huge question of just like public support of arts and culture in general. Um, so it's been wonderful to have philanthropic support growing and, and, and corporate support. Um, and I, and I like to think perhaps that what we do is to be a place for the public to experiment um, without having that investment. And a, a small set of projects we haven't talked quite a lot about because they're very much in development and they're not actually about publicity is with the Field Foundation. We have these pro connector projects that include um, the Public Housing Museum doing a walking tour of Cabrini Green or um, the Torture Justice Monument that got funding um, officially is kind of a reparations and they need to build a, a more memorial and how can they bring international expertise and and the the victims together to to do a charrette or um, some of these closed schools there's been a wonderful project to sort of reimagine what they're like so these are just real projects they you know they we're not forcing to make exhibits but the idea is that we can uh, provide a micro grant and provide some of our audience for whatever or, or some of our contacts to advance um, the public interest in Chicago. Um, and we'd like to think that perhaps those, you know, perhaps the future is how does the public support the kinds of things that get off the ground through the biennial. But certainly um, that takes a lot of support from a lot of sectors. Thank you. Um, speaking of corporate and uh, <clears throat> philanthropic groups that are involved, um, I don't know how many of you have taken advantage of the SC Johnson program. SC Johnson's one of the primary corporate sponsors. Um, I'm working with SC Johnson and a destination management company called Allied PRA. And you've probably noticed all the kiosks around Chicago and all the publicity uh, offering free tours from the Cultural Center in Chicago up to Racine, Wisconsin where we visit the administration building and the lab building designed by Frank Lloyd Wright, 1936 and 39. And if you come on weekends, we take you to the, probably the last prairie style home designed by Mr. Wright called Wing Spread. And included in that, you get to stop at the famous o h Danish Bakery, <laughs> where you can buy the official pastry of Wisconsin, the Kringle. But in all seriousness, we took 6,000 people up there in 2015. We're on track to bring about 8,000 visitors. We talked about the international flavor here among our distinguished panel in that. On some of the buses that I've acted as the guide on, we've had architects, we've had people interested in urban issues urban problems, areas and that, from every continent in the world. And we get a lot of young students as well, not only architecture students, but um, high school and uh, community college classes 
14, 15 people at a time come on these tours. You leave at about, on the weekend, 8 in the morning, we have you back by 3 in the morning. I'm only, it seems that way, 3 in the afternoon. But there's been so much construction around the cultural center, it could be 3 in the morning. Okay, anyhow, if you're interested in that, check out the SC Johnson website. It's something that everybody should take advantage of, and it's absolutely free. Now, let's give a big round of applause to our panelists.